I'm telling us Christians, we got the answer. And it's the joy of God and the message of victory on the inside of you. And it has got to shine out of you, out of every, out of every cell in your body. You are, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that? Every cell in your body is a house of the presence of God because your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Because of the Word of God is shining through every part of your being. The Bible says, because of that I am quickened, I am made whole. I can walk in the healing power of God because I let the Holy Spirit shine through, not just through my leg, it's through my whole being. Walk in, shine. What are you doing? I'm shining. <laughs> shining. That, <laughs> shine. We all shine, church. The stars in glory. You're going to be like the angels in glory. You, you can't even look at some of them. You are going to shine so bright. You are destined in eternity to shine and reflect the glory of the Son of God without any hindrance. You are going to shine and reflect all His glory. Bless God. May be in an inner vessel. May be in an earthen vessel. But every cell of my body, you get to shine the best you can. Shine, shine, shine. Glory, glory. Got to be a Bible third to Isaiah. Isaiah 35, and we'll start there. We want to bring everything, back. we want to bring a nation, a generation back to the divine covenant with God. Take this day to, to face hell's kingdom with the glory of heaven. Find out what belongs to us and at times what we lose and how to get it back. Somebody say yes. yes. Isaiah 35 speaks about an event of the kingdom power of God. What is going to be demonstrated and what you and I are actually seeing it and walking in with the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit from the book of Acts, Acts 2 all the way on, actually starting in the very ministry of Jesus to today. God's kingdom and God's glory, but there's always an attempt to hinder that by hell, but there's always a way to get the reign of God back. Confrontation to victory. Send the reign, Lord. Send the reign. The Bible says in chapter 35 and verse 1, I'm going to read this. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad, and even the desert land shall rejoice and blossom. Say it's blossoming time. God says it doesn't matter how dead and dry it was. One touch of the Spirit of God and everything is revived that's been broke in your life. He's giving you a natural vision to show you something spiritual where he's showing you that all the waste desert land suddenly by the transformation of God's presence suddenly begin to blossom and shine with the abundance of what God could produce. And it's a symbol and a sign of what God wants to do in every heart and every life. It shall blossom abundantly at the rose with the joy in singing. Somebody say joy. Joy. Somebody say joy. I understand there's COVID out there, but in the middle of COVID, you know what I got? Joy. Who's got joy? joy. Come on, that's my joy of the Lord is your strength. That is your victory. I possess joy. Devil, you cannot have, you cannot have my joy. You cannot, that's my joy. That's God's joy he gave to me. That's says my joy. You cannot have my joy. COVID cannot have my joy. It cannot have my joy. Why? Because it's my joy. I'm going to stand in my joy. I'm going to shout with my joy. I'm going to sing with my joy. I'm going to overcome with my joy. I'm going to get breakthrough with my joy. I'm healed standing in my joy. So it says, so all the glory of the provisions of God that belong to the body of Christ to walk in. He says, the glory of Lebanon. The greatness of the cedar trees, the, the governmental authority of God, the beauty and its splendor. Come your kingdom, be done your will. I'll give you the splendor of the mounts of Lebanon. 
in its snow-capped peaks, revealing the tall and the strength of the cedar. I will give you the blessings of the governmental authority of God. How do I know? Because the Bible says you will reign in Christ. And in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, because Jesus Christ has given you authority. You have authority. That's what belongs to you in Christ. The excellence of Carmel, and we're about to go there. Carmel was a beautiful mountainside, and it was along the very coast of the Mediterranean Sea. It was a place of beauty and beautiful splendor. It also was the platform that housed the greatest of the prophetic voices. It was a platform where Elisha would have the schools of the prophets. It was a place in a mountain where even the altar of God had been placed. And throughout the nation of Israel, while men looked for that place, they would set an altar and claim it for God. Set an altar and claim it for God. Yes, they put up altars, but they always built them the right way. And they would claim it for God and claim it for God and claim it for God and claim it for God. And even on Carmel, there was an altar that belonged to the Lord God. The Jehovah God. And all of this purpose. And where the voice of the prophetic would keep a nation standing in the right place and in the right order. For when it's untainted, the voice of God leads and directs. There's the inward witness of the Holy Spirit that will tell you this is the way. Walk thee in it. The Holy Spirit of God always leading and always directing. When it's walking in the pureness of heaven, it is like the prophetic song of the Lord. The gentleness of God moving and ministering and driving and leading you. And there that beautiful mountain declaring the prophetic of God that would lead and direct the nation. The Bible says even the valleys of Sharon. The excellence of Sharon, the valleys of provision, no lack. The government of God, the prophetic word and heart of God, and the very provision of God. God's called every one of his people to walk in it so that you find that you have no lack. No matter what you go through in life, you've got authority. No matter what you go through in life, you've got the word of God, the revelation of God right with you. And no matter where you go in life, lack or abundance, it does not matter. God is still your provision and your source and your resource. And the more we trust that, the more we walk there, the less the devil can ever touch what belongs to God. When you clothe yourself with this, the devil has nothing on you. That's why we have the right to walk in victory every place we can. Jesus said, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. In where in that phrase does he give you a closing date? He never said, up until this time frame. And then you're on your own. He said, no, I will build my church. I will keep building, I will keep expanding, and the gates of hell will not stop the advancement of the kingdom of God and the child of God because I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. I'm going to give you the right to exercise the authority of God's word. Hallelujah. That's why, church, we're not walking where we need to be, but God wants to pull us there. He wants to put the word of his victory in your mouth in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We're not here to care what the world thinks. We're here to fill the ark of God with billions of people as he holds back the very hordes of hell until he is prepared and well fed with his harvest and he has the souls that he has redeemed and gloriously we are transformed and transitioned into his presence until that day. I will build my church. Now I want you to go back in your Bible to 1 Kings. I want you to look at the problem that had snuck into the nation. This was the prophetic word that God gave Isaiah that was for the nation. This was to be their future and the purpose of God the joy and the fragrance, with the outpouring of God. This, this what you were to see in the natural was to break forth by the Spirit of God and transform you. But there's always a devil on the horizon, always trying to distract you and deceive you 
and pull you and direct you in anything but heaven. He is the enemy of all that is called good. He has despised everything of God. And he's always working to call you from God to himself. Satan wants worship. He doesn't deserve an ounce of it. He is a cursed being. And we must recognize it. Banished from the presence of God forever. To be tossed into a lake of fire. And remembered no more. That is that is judgment. It is sealed. It shall not, cannot, ever will be changed. Cursed from the very presence of God. He has nothing at all that he thought he had. Now he craves and he thirsts and he hungers every demon power to get a little bit of worship from you. That's why they try to pull you in to get you away from God because they lost it all. And if they can get you to worship them for just a little bit, that is what they crave because they lost everything. Chapter 16. First Kings. I want you, I'm going to read a few of this. So stay with me. We need to see what took place. A nation called and founded on the things of God. Called out of Egypt. The power of miracles from Joshua. The establishment of godly kings. The temple of God that now was finally established. All the praising and the worshiping and the leading of such great kings as David and Saul and I mean David and Solomon and then on down the line. Few more were going to come up, beautiful, wonderful people of God looking to keep a nation. But there always was an enemy, always on the outside looking to find a reason to bring a destruction. And we find that when it did and when he does step in, he brings a calamity in its midst. And all the blessings of God dry up. God can't bless what's cursed. God can never bless what's cursed. God's not here to bless your past. He wants to bless your present, your purpose, and your future. And unless they're connected to Christ, he can never bless them. Then it stands under the curse. We need to understand that when the devil gets in, the curse gets in because the devil is cursed. The 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. Now, this was great. We're going to see a downfall in Israel, but we're going to see a wave of revival. Somebody say revival. In the, in the 38th year of Asa, the king of Judah, the man who also sought after the heart of God, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. Now, Ahab, think to this. Ahab, the son of Omri, three times they've mentioned this guy's name, did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. The leadership of the nation drew the nation from God and put its focus on devil worship. Pulled the whole nation from the things of God. Started few few generations earlier, but this was the worst of the king. Pulled them from the blessing and the favor and the knowledge and the walk and the victory and the presence and the blessings of God and turned them to demon worship. And God cannot bless when you worship what is cursed. He cannot bless it. When you bring the curse in, and you worship the curse, then all the blessings have to go. And the judgment that belongs to the curse now begins to rest with you because you have that accursed thing in your life. Believers, that's why you get every bit of witchcraft out of your home. You get every lying spirit out of your house. I don't care what your kids brought in. You throw it out the back door. You get every implement of the devil because it's cursed, because it's attached to him. Get it out, get it out, get it out, get it out, get it out. Find it, get it out, burn that thing. It's cursed. Not to be too radical. But God was very clear to the nation. Very clear through Leviticus and all through Deuteronomy. Do not let it in. It will curse the nation. Drive it out. It will curse. He warned them again and again. Do not bring it in. Do not bring it in. You bring it in, you will bring the curse in. And I can no longer bless when you bring the curse in. Drive the curse out every time. We must make a decision 
Get the curse out of the house of God. Get the sin out of the house of God. Get the wickedness out of the house of God. Get the righteousness back into the house of God. So when the house of God is walking in the righteousness of God, then we can present the righteousness of God to a nation which is standing in the curse and we can begin to work at driving the curse out of the nation. Make sense? He did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Bible says he did evil more than all who were ever before him. I don't know how much evil this man could do. It came to pass that it became a trivial thing for him to walk in all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the very first king that took the nation down and successive king after successive king after... Listen, they walked from God and served devils. Witchcraft on every corner. It's amazed how many high priests of witchcraft they had. Thousands of them. That's what was ruling the nation. That's why God's going to shut the heavens. Because he's about to address one of their gods and prove that that God ain't got squat. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Because it says he had married Jezebel. We all know that name. Never name your kid Jezebel. Poor child will hate you all their life for a good cause. Mother, why did you bring me Jezebel? I was in a bad mood, all right? I'm sorry. If you met your father's mother, no, I'm kidding. I'm just saying. I know. I know how it's like, really. Come on, some of you were thinking of somebody as soon as I said that name. Mm-mm, so don't give me that. All right. It said, and he went and served Baal. And worship him. He drew the nation to worship the chief of all the devils. This is like worshiping Satan himself. There are trillions of demon powers. Principalities that all want worship. But he went after the Lord of the lords of the devils. He went after, he went after without, because he's stupid. He went after Lucifer himself and he began to worship the one that they thought was the one that brought all the rain, that brought all the provisions, that brought the sun, that brought, the, that brought everything. He was the great provider for the nation. And he brought them to the place of worshiping him. Not the one that is the source of blessing. And once you begin to worship devils, you begin to worship everything that the devil wants you and how he wants you to worship. And since the devil is all darkness, there will be no light in how he wants you to worship. You will defile yourself. You will defile things around you. You will give up sacrifice. You will do whatever the devil wants because he's always promising you something he cannot give you. Can't give you eternal life. And he only can give you a bit of temporal power only because it's his. He will take you with it. Just start setting it up that way. And not only that, but he set up an altar to Baal. This really what got God. Set up an altar to Baal in the temple. And he also had a temple to Baal. And he set up an altar to Baal in Baal's temple. So he not only made a temple for Baal, but he put altars in the temple. And other kings put altars to Baal in the temple of God. See, I speak to us as the body of Christ in this, in this nation. Not about rolling around and being crazy, but it's recognizing. There are altars to hell all over the place. The nation's been sold every vile thing. It doesn't matter what, they've sold the nation down the tube. They try to corrupt and destroy our children because they're worshiping demonic activity and they brought it in to the house and they want to destroy a generation and they don't realize that they are the very pawns of the devil, a devil that is cursed and will never win. And the church must be the one to rise up to see what's going on and begin to push back with the reign of God. Set up an altar to Baal. He made a, a Asherah pole. These were images that were connected right alongside Baal, big poles that they used for fertility. And they actually bowed, and they worshipped, and they had priests. There are 850 prophets and priests to these two that alone served the king and his wife. Can you imagine the type of witchcraft that was taking place? This was the governing spirit over the nation and God said that will be about enough. 
and the prophetic voice of heaven, the voice that should stand with the prophets on Carmel, was suddenly released to a prophet named Elijah. And God said, I'm going to curse what I've already cursed, and I'm going to curse that devil. There, serve, shut the heavens. Shut them tight. But hell itself was destroying the people of God. So God was coming to get the attention of the people of God. He said, I'll show you what I'll do. I'll shut the heavens. And God put the word of God on the prophet. And he said, you shut those heavens and you hold them shut till I tell you to open them. Notice, there was no Baal, there's no devil, there's no Lucifer, there's no nothing else that could unlock what this man had just done because it was by the word of God. And when God gives that word, ain't, ain't, ain't a devil and Hell, they can undo the word of God. They're not a devil anywhere. They don't have the power. They're not in the throne room. They don't have the glory. They have nothing. Their whole throne is the earth. Far below everything that God is. They've lost it all. So when God releases a decree, it is far above every principality and power. And when he releases the word, ain't no devil can reach, grab, claw, scratch, stop it. They can't do it. Because you've released the word of God. Do not fear devils. So child of God, do not fear him. Chapter 17, it was Elisha the Tishbite, the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, tell you what you and your wicked administration are about to go through. As the Lord God of Israel is before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Okay, let's see what we can do. All the prophets of Baal, all the prophets of Asherah, all these prophets and prophetesses are out there constantly dealing with their demons, trying to hear from a seashell, conjuring up what they can, worshiping their idols, doing everything they can to try to get their demon powers to reverse what this prophet of God had stopped or what this prophet of God had done. And you know what God did? God whisked the prophet of God away. So since the word was already said, you can't get the prophet, you can't get the word. So all of the devils, all of these, all of these worshipers had to try to change what God had done. For three and a half years, they were out of, they had nothing. Think about it. They're worshiping all day long. They're sacrificing to Baal and Asherah. They're all over 850, just the ones that were with them, let alone the thousands of others they had released across the nation. And not a one of them could change what God had done. We have such a mighty God. Doesn't matter what disease tries to fling in or fling out. It will not change the plan of God. It cannot stop the plan of God. It cannot interrupt the plan of God. God already knew what was going to come. And when God knew what was going to come, he already had the plan to drive right through no matter what comes. He will build his church. No gates of hell can stop what God is doing. And the church needs to recognize, do not fear. Do not fear. Three and a half years, God hid the prophet. Three and a half years, the nation went into drought. Three and a half years, all the prophets of Baal could do nothing. And then God said, now it's time for a confrontation. Somebody say confrontation. Amen. Confrontation is what brings the victory, especially when you stand strong in the confrontation. People don't want to contend with the devil, but the Bible says you're not at war with mankind. You're at war with principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness is in all kinds of different places. You are at war with the devil. That means you are in a contention with the devil. You might as well realize it and figure it out. You are at war with the devil. That's why you put on the whole armor of God. Not to just look shiny, nice at a coffee, tea, whatever. It's so you can go to war against the devil. You are clothed with the armor of God to win the battle. Not look nice at the tea clutch. Whatever the heck that is. Anybody know what a tea clutch is? I think it's where they sit around and they all just, you know. What do you think? Oh, I armor. Oh, looks nice. Oh, you got, oh, your armor looks really nice. Your armor's this color. Your armor's that color. Your armor ought to be a little bit used. Tell me what color your armor is. Show me the dents. Show me the dings. Come on, people. Your armor, your armor needs to be shown as it's been used. Chapter 18. God puts a, 
God releases the prophet. It's time to go and face Ahab. It's time to bring this thing around. Time to take back what the devil has stolen for the season. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus said, I've come to have life. Always expect Jesus to come that we may have life. Always expect Jesus to come. Oh, he is the guy on the white horse coming to riding on in with the horse and the white hat or whatever it is, coming to be your rescue, your and your deliverer. Jesus has always got an answer. He's always on his way in. Doesn't matter what the devil came to steal, kill, and whatever. He said, I have come that you may have life and life abundant, and that is not changed. Doesn't matter what the devil does. Jesus is always on the horizon. He's got the breakthrough. It's right there. But sometimes it's connected to the confrontation. So, so here you've got to get the people to take a look and make a decision. Who are we going to serve? Who is going to be God over our lives? From whom comes the blessings and the victory and the grace? From whom comes eternal life? Who is the one that can heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils? To whom do we serve that we get the peace of heaven and the glory and the joy of God? You do not get any of that from Satan's kingdom. You get heartache and headache and brokenness and disease and fear and death. You get nothing from his kingdom that has anything to do with God. You get nothing. The people needed to see the demonstration. So God said, it's time to demonstrate. Since your God's supposed to be the God that can bring the rain and everything else, let's see what he can do. I'll give you a chance here. So what he says is, now therefore, verse 19, chapter 18 of 1 Kings, he says, now therefore, and this is Elijah has the confrontation with, with Ahab. Isn't it funny that evil always tries to blame good when evil things happen? Evil did it. They did it. But then they blame you when something happens because they did it. It's your fault that what I did took place and brought trouble and heartache. Somehow it's your fault. Why? Because I don't like you. I don't like anything about you. Why? Because you don't worship the God I worship. And I want to worship devils and demons. And you don't like my devils and demons, so I don't like you. Who's offended? Yawn. Therefore, sorry, <laughs> you might as well go, oh, it's bad. I'm a child of the most high God. As David said to that Philistine, I don't care how big and ugly you are, you just come against me with your sword and your spear and everything else. I'll come against you in the name of the God of the armies of Israel, whose head from your head I'm going to take because you have defiled God's people and you're in trouble. And you're going down. Because my God is bigger than all of your gods. I have faith in my God. You got to get that attitude when we go to war and prayer. So he says, what you're going to do. You're not going to blame me. You're get your prophets. We're going to meet at the place that's supposed to be the prophetic heart of God. And we're going to take it back. We want the word of God now going over this nation. Not the word of devils and demons and darkness. It's a spirit of wickedness around every corner. We want the word of the Lord reaching over our children and the generation. We want the body of Christ. We want the Bible says your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. Right. Devils tried to make them prophesy his language. We want to have them prophesy God's language. This young generation needs to know the authority of the Holy Ghost and begin to preach and speak and teach and declare the very things of heaven to the very chagrin and the fear of those that have tried to put the spirit of hell on them and destroy the very bodies and the very life. Won't it be amazing when the generation suddenly jumps up and begins to sing in the Holy Ghost, pray in the Holy Ghost, prophesy in the Holy Ghost, they are, the enemy is going to scream and it will not matter. Devils always scream on their way out. Shut the door on your way. Therefore, he says, send men. Get all the prophets. How many? All of them. All of them. 
You've got to understand our authority as, as believers. Get all the prophets together. Bring them all in here. And we're going to have a powwow on the mount. We're going to all meet us all at Mount Carmel. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered all the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And the Bible said, and Elijah, verse 21, came to the people and said, How long will you fall to between two, two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. Make a decision. Somebody say decision time. I say this always over, 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 the, over the church and the body of Christ. I mean this in a positive, powerful way. We need to make a decision. Who are we following? We are following the leading of the Holy Spirit that we always need to be driving forward and taking territory back. Go in and take back everything the devil has stolen. Every time we see, every time we walk, walk by the Spirit of God, we should always be going in and taking territory back. But when we start faltering, we sit down and do nothing but complain about everything that's happening in our lives. And then we want to blame God, and then we want to blame this, and we want to blame that. But we don't want to get up and let the Holy Ghost set a fire underneath your behind, so you begin to run the race in the Holy Ghost. It's confrontation time. We may Make a decision. We can no longer falter between two positions. If God is God, let's go to war for God. And that's the truth. So he said, you guys got to make a decision. They all just sat there with that dumb look on their face. All of the leaders, what he brought together on Mount on Mount Carmel was all the leaders of the nation. Not just the people. He brought the leaders. And the leaders stood there. Duh. Because all the prophets were there. All the prophets of Baal. All the prophets of Ashur were there. And they were afraid of them. That's why they could not speak. Because they didn't know God. All they knew was fear. And the controlling element of hell itself, he says, fine, here's what you're going to do. You go ahead and you get your sacrifice together. You get us two bulls, you take yours. You cut your bull up and you do whatever it does. And you put that thing and then you make the sacrifice. And let's see if your God Baal can bring the rain. Because that's what he's supposed to be able to do. You get, every, you get all 850. Everybody come together. You build your little altar. And you put your sacrifice on it and you cry out to your God and listen, the devil doesn't have the power because when God's in it, all God's got to do is this. And ain't one demon can get past his hand. Not one. They were held to the ground. They could not move because God said, no, your sacrifice has no authority with me. They were sacrificing to devils. And they had no power with God. Think about this. Look into the spirit realm. And you see all these demonic things. They are cowering and they're afraid. Because the power of God is present. And God said, you don't move from this line. And they're cutting themselves and they're shouting and they're doing everything. Vile they can all the way to the end of the day. And they ain't got nothing. Except they're, they're all now a little anemic. That means blood loss, okay? <clears throat> so Elijah says, okay, that's about enough. Somebody say, that's about enough. He gave the devil, as he gave them a chance. And the reason why he did is because he knew that it was going to be God's turn. Do not fear devils. Doesn't matter what all comes out. Then it's God's turn. So he said, then it's God's turn. It's always going to be God's turn if we let him. Say, if we let him, if we let him, it's got to be God's turn. God's turn's coming. It's, it's God's turn. Devil can throw all he wants, stick whatever he wants. Then it's God's turn. Somebody say, then it's God's turn. Now it's round two. <laughs> Listen, it's God's turn. Elijah stood alone against 850 of the prophets of Baal and Asherah who were worshiping the very top of the demon line. And he stood alone. And he's a man just like you and I. He is no different. James says he's a man of like passions. Just like you and I. The effectual for prayer of the righteous man has much power with God. So as Elijah could, so could you. He was no better or different. All you had to be was an available individual to hear the word of God and stand your ground. It didn't matter. 
Jesus drove out thousands of demons from one man. You're bigger in the Holy Ghost than you think you are. We're bigger in the Holy Ghost than we think we are. And that's what the devil has done so good for. We forgot the power of God. We forgot the word of God. We forgot the anointing of God. We tossed the gifts of the spirit out because it's not protocol, status quo. It won't just grow our churches full of dead people that don't know God and have no power to fight against God. They have no word in them to know who they are even in God. And whether or not they're even saved is a, is a big question mark in some of these places. How is that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? It is not. They can't face one demon, not one disease. They have no knowledge. That's why we got to be the way we are, church. We want to confront a nation. We can't do that till we confront the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in love. Can we stand right here like Elijah by the word of the Holy Ghost? Because you know the Holy Ghost. Because you have a relationship with him. You know God is real. And if the Holy Spirit wants you to stand your ground, you know God is right there with you. It doesn't matter if there are 10,000 come against you. It shall not come nigh your dwelling. Because you know who you are. The boldness of grace. That's why Elijah stood there. Because he had all of heaven. Oh, somebody say, I got all of heaven. I got all of heaven on your side. It's all of heaven on my side. It's what you got. Oh, I got all of heaven on my side. There ain't nothing in heaven which is not on your side. The devil may have taken a third, but there's the other two thirds. <laughs> the deck is still stacked against him. Let me bring it through here. So he had about enough of it, and he said, now, it's time to make a rededication. He said, come here. This is verse 30. He had enough of their aimless sacrifice. It was doing nothing. <clears throat> it was all smoke and mirrors. Ain't no rain coming. Listen, you go on. Don't be heading off to the, to the stargazers and, and the people who read your palms. And I said this in a program years ago. Just get your money back. <clears throat> and here, I got your future right here. <clears throat> I got your direction to live right here. I got the blessings and promises right here. I've got how to walk in it right here. You don't need some liar, some charlatan, some fraud, taking your money and then putting their devils on you, and you end up going nowhere when you got the answer right here. You don't need it. Put them out of business. Because nobody knows this. That's why they are being funded. Because we don't know the word. Then Elijah stood and he says, all right, everybody, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. And verse 30 says he did something. He found the altar that had been broken down. An altar had been put there some odd years ago, and that was a place where they had worshipped God. It had been busted down because the altars of Baal were standing in the way, and, and the things that God had been crushed. That's why the prophetic has got to come this way. And he said, first we're going to do, we are going to rebuild the covenant standard of God. And he took that altar and he went stone by stone, 12 stones, and built himself a nice altar back. But the altar is not enough until the, until the sacrifice is consecrated. And that altar represented the entire nation of Israel. It represented the covenant of them coming out of Egypt. It represented the covenant of going into the promised land. It represented everything that God had said to them, all the miracles God had done for them. Everything God talked about, his angel and his presence being with them. That altar declared that Jehovah God was their God. And you and I serve the ultimate in him and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got the altar and our altar has become Calvary. And and now the altar is now empty and the tomb is now empty and we got a king who is now sitting in glory saying, I am the true altar, I am the true sacrifice. And everything they had offered was failure. Get God's altar back first. And that's what he did. With his own hands he built this altar. And he got all the wood and put it all over it. He made a consecration and a dedication. They took what they needed, the water, and they poured it all over it and poured it all over it and poured it. They saturated everything. Not a cloud in the sky. 
Consecrate yourself. Somebody say consecrate. Got to win a nation. We got to give ourselves wholly to God. That was pouring out of everything. Everything they poured. The water is what they needed, but it was a water is what he poured out. And I mean, I mean, big jars of water, big jars of this of this commodity that they needed, and poured more and poured more and poured because he made sure it was fully consecrated. And he stood back. He rebuilt the things of God. He said, this, the standards and the covenants that this altar represents are the standards and the covenants on which the sacrifice, which will ultimately be Jesus Christ, will rest. And this and this only is the covenant that God will honor and bless because the fragrance of the covenant he established is what comes before his nose. And when he smells the fragrance of true righteousness, that's when the blessing begins to come and the rain begins to come and the curse is lifted because God's nostrils are satisfied with a righteous sacrifice. And he builds it and he puts the offering up there and he tells the Lord and he steps back and says, Lord, this is what you told me to do. Verse 37. He said, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this is verse 36. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel. You, 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 not Baal, not Asherah, not New Age. No other religion can shake the heavens like this. No other religion can bring the rain. No demon can bring the rain. They ain't got the power, but God has got it all. And he says, you know, here the one. And you know that I'm your servant. I've done all these things at your word. Your word has held the heavens. And now your word is going to open the heavens. At your word, think about the power of the word of God, church. Let's get that down. Hear me, Lord. These people may know that you are Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. And the fire of the Lord fell. God demonstrated. He stands behind his righteous covenant. Stands behind his righteous service. He stands behind the work of Calvary. He stands behind his son. There is no other name in which you can get access to the presence of Father but the name of Jesus Christ. All the heaven moves on that name. And this altar was a precursor to the most marvelous offering and sacrifice, the covenant of God. And God was pleased. And the fire roared out of heaven, consumed everything. Instant revelation to the people who was God. That's my church. That's why we got to walk in the things of God. That's why we got to know the power of God, the anointing of God, the healing of God, the demonstrations of God. Because devils are trying to falsely demonstrate and people are following a lie because the church has had no fire, no power, and no demonstration. It's time for the fire to fall upon the body of Christ and the anointing of God to begin to sweep through the very halls of every church and the kingdom of God begin to advance and the delivering power of heaven begin to demonstrate. Stand to your feet in the house. Fire fell. Wasn't done. The fire of God came and consumed the sacrifice saying, I accept it. And I always encourage pastors and churches and believers, all of us together as one accord, does God accept us? By that I mean, does he accept the sacrifice of our praise? Your praise is connected to your covenant. Do you know God in your praise? Is your life a consecrated vessel to all the principles of heaven? Is Jesus Christ genuinely Lord of your life? So just like the disciples and the apostolic and all that fell on that day and has been falling ever since, the power of God fell on a sacrifice that had been made acceptable by the blood of Jesus Christ. The fire fell on the sacrifice that was acceptable and all it was for them was just surrendering and coming under the covenant of God. They were found acceptable because the righteousness of the genuine sacrifice was now on them. And the fire fell. Consumed it all. They were shaking in their heart. And when they went to war against all the witchcraft and all the wickedness. And they drove it from their presence. 
And that day they threw them all off a cliff. When the fire of God falls, it comes to drive out everything that doesn't belong. And when everything that doesn't belong begins to be driven out, then you have the right to listen for the sound of the abundance of rain so that all that Carmel and all that the great oaks of God and all that, the, all that the Sharon Valley, all that belongs to you can now come. Because the Bible will say in Isaiah, it said because there's going to come springs of living water. It says in verse 6, Isaiah 35, because when all these things are happening, water shall burst forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert. I will give my thirsty ones satisfaction. We want the rain of God. Lift your hands up before the Lord.